Hi, Year 11. This is Ms. McIntosh's Complete and Nerdy Guide to Banquo, full of more word etymology and random detail than you will get anywhere else, guaranteed. So let's go to the all important information. You'll notice that I'm lying. It's not a musical. Although if any of you would like to make it into a musical, please do. It is, however, a complete and genius guide to being a complete genius about Banquo. So here's the basics. He's in act one, um, up to act three, scene three, after which he dies. That's the one where he's murdered by not one, not two, but three murderers. Uh, then he's a ghostly or imagined presence in act three, scene four, the banquet scene and Act 4, Scene 1, as the father of the line of kings in the Weird Sister's third and final apparition. However, even though there's no points on our exam board for context, what you should keep in mind always is that he's actually an overarching presence in the play. He's a really important figure in the Stuart monarchy's explanation of why they have a right to the throne. As it says here, the new king, James I, traced his lineage back to the historic figure of Banquo, who may actually have been made up apocryphal, but he was very central to their quasi-mythological chart of, of descent. Shakespeare aud Shakespeare's audience would therefore see him from Act I as the rightful father of the English and Scottish thrones. So he doesn't play that kind of role on stage. He's not part of the jockeying for kingship, except that Shakespeare's audience knows Shakespeare specifically performing this play in the court of King James knows that his audience sees Banquo as the original and best. His core dramatic function, aside from that one, which is really important contextual and meaningful function, is as a foil to Macbeth, right? So a foil, I've got a definition here and it's on every page thereafter because you really cannot get this wrong in literature. A foil is a character that has characteristics that oppose another character, usually the protagonist. The foil character may be completely opposite to the protagonist or very similar, but with one key difference. The foil character is used to highlight some particular quality or qualities of the main character. So the foil isn't the antagonist, the protagonist person that their verse is throughout. That would be Macduff in this play, wouldn't it? Right. The foil specifically exists so that we can understand Macbeth more by seeing how Banquo is not like him. If Macbeth does one thing, Banquo is doing something else entirely, and we can that way see an awful lot more about Macbeth and about things which turn out to be choices which might have seemed inevitable without Banquo next to him. Uh, now I'm going to go through pretty much line by line um, of Banquo's appearances. I get bored somewhere in Act 3 and stop when it's just him talking to murderers. But every single one of his lines has a lot of interesting things to do with it. So very first appearance with Macbeth is just through description. The sergeant's been dragged in from the field. He's bleeding from his wounds. King Duncan wants to know about these two heroes on the field. Dismayed not this, our captains Man ba Macbeth and Banquo. Right? And the sergeant says, yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If I say sooth, if I'm telling the truth, I must report that they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. Notice how I've put those words in bold there, double, doubly, redoubled. We've got a tripled repetition of some variant of the word double. They're a pair. These men are equals, right? Our captains, says the king. Both men are equal and loyal to the king. They belong to the king. Um, and both of them are equally violent. Both of them are described with the same metaphors. So eagles and lions, predatory animals. And both of them are described as weapons, specifically as cannons. Um, but as we know from with dramatic irony, only one of them will go on to hunt King Duncan. Only one of them is truly a predator to Duncan. Only one will aim their weapon at the king. So doubles equals two people exactly the same in description. And then we first meet them at the same time again. So we've had them both described in the past. We meet them, their first appearance, they're on the heath, they're coming away from the battle. And Macbeth says, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Now we, the audience and the carefully attentive year 11 readers know that he's evoking there the language of the witches from act one, scene one. So we know immediately that he's associated with them somehow, that there is something uncanny about Macbeth, or that certainly he's tuned into that language of the supernatural. Banquo, however, says, how far is it called to forest, right? 
how far are we? Where are we going? How far are we on our journey? So what I've written here is Macbeth's first line is a wary declarative about the weather. He's attuned to the atmosphere. Banquo's first line is a question about the progress of their journey. And he will make questions throughout this scene and throughout his role in the play. He's a man who questions, a man who, of action, but a man who sees through appearances, questions the nature of reality. And here, Macbeth talking about the weather, Banquo, where are we going? And then the witches have appeared. What are these so withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it? Question one, live you? Question two, or are you all that man may question? Question three, you seem to understand me by each at once her chappy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Macbeth, speak if you can, what are you? So Banco asks a series of interrogatives as soon as the weird sisters appear. He's interrogating their nature, He's interrogating them. He wants to know what's going on. Some productions of this um, make that quite laugh out loud funny when he's mocking them because he shows no respect to them. We've got these strange supernatural creatures appear and he points out that they've got beards. He, he um, mocks their femininity. It's quite a misogynist moment in a way undercutting their power. Contrast that to the way Macbeth respects female power is really overawed by female power throughout the play. Um, Macbeth demands if they speak, speak if you can, what are you? So he immediately wants an answer. Banquo wants to know what they are. And then, you know, of course we get all hail Macbeth. And then our next big speech from Banquo, he reacts to Macbeth's prediction. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? Banquo is keenly aware of Macbeth's reactions. For the rest of this scene and the next couple, he's going to be telling the audience or um, other characters on stage how Macbeth is acting. Because Macbeth, as he'll do increasingly throughout the play, um, abstracts out on stage. It's not that he's having asides and soliloquies and the rest of the audience don't know what's going on. Macbeth is having almost seizure absences, right? He's staring, his hair's standing on end. He's he's confused and, and deranged. Think of the banquet scene where um, Lady Macbeth has to essentially invent this history of epilepsy to explain why it is that he's acting this way. Um, so Banquo, looking around, observing. Think of him as a detective, right? And then another series of interrogatives challenging the witches, right? In the name of truth, are you fantastical? Or that indeed which outwardly you show? Question one. My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and see which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Right? He uses an imperative to command them to speak, makes it clear he has no vested interest in their answer. So that contrasts with Macbeth's, you know, what are you? Speak to me. And here, that seeds of time image will be instantly evocative to his audience. And we'll see that again and again and again, if you can look into the seeds of time. Because Banquo's seed will end up being James the I. We think forward to Act Four, where we have the apparition of Banquo's seed, line after line after line of them, ending in king after king after king. That, those are the seeds of time. We're, we're going to see seeds again um, being spoken from, from a king's mouth in a, in a couple of scenes. And then the prediction that they give to Banquo. Lesser than the Macbeth and greater, not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. And then the next switch says, Banquo and Macbeth all hail. So here they're paired constantly, but contrasted. It's an oxymoronic system. You're, you're not as happy and yet you're happier, right? It's an uncanny parallel, an uncanny comparison. It seems illogical and irrational, and yet it's telling the truth, which ties us into our, our theme of equivocation where they tell the truth, but don't seem like it's so. And here, what I find most interesting perhaps is the inversion of their names from one witch to the other. All hail Mac Macbeth and Banquo, Banquo and Macbeth all hail. And um, there's a moment in Hamlet where um, the king and queen say to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, thanks Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, thanks Guildenstern and Rosencrantz. And it's a way of showing that they are equally held and equally esteemed by the court. Um, and here, the fact that their names can be inverted that way shows again that they're a pair, but they're different, they're contrasted definition of foil there on the page so you can keep going back to that then we have 
the witches disappear, Banquo and Macbeth react. The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither have they vanished? Into the air, see, ended with a question mark there. Into the air, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed, says Macbeth, who wishes that they had stayed. Right, not asking questions, not questioning reality, instead wishing they'd say more. Banquo, were such things here as we do speak about? Another question. Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Banquo is unwilling to accept the evidence of his senses, right? When I say he's applying the scientific method here, it's actually, this is kind of nerdy extra, he's sort of presaging here um, discourse on method by Descartes, who in his famous summary, which many of you will have heard of, I think therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, goes through and proves how the evidence of all of his senses can be tricked by taking drugs by being tired, maybe he's asleep, right? We can't use our senses to prove anything because our senses can be confused in a variety of ways. What we do rely on, what we can rely on, is our thinking. This is Descartes' argument. And this is what Banquo is doing. He's applying logic, he's applying thought, he's questioning what's going on. Are we drugged, eaten on the insane route? Have we just had a vision? Have we gone mad? Have we lost our minds? Macbeth doesn't question anything. So again, his role as a foil here is to show how unthinkingly Macbeth goes along with things. We see tons of times where Macbeth is thinking and questioning the right thing to do, but he doesn't question the fundamental nature of what he's being presented with, and Banquo always does. And then when the first of the prophecies happens, Banquo bursts out, what can the devil speak true? Right, it's a blunt, shocked, exclaimed interrogative. It correctly names the satanic source of what's going on, the word devil there. <coughs> and it goes to the heart of the equivocation that is the weird sister's primary technique for temptation, the devil speaking truth. Right, so Macbeth staggered and we know his hair stands on end and he instantly thinks, oh, you know, starts having those visions of what he should do to murder Duncan, but Banquo, immediately questions the nature of the truth of the people who've told them the truth. So he sees the equivocation, right? The equivocation of the fiend who lies like truth we have later. Banquo sees through it, always sees through it. Then we have Banquo and Macbeth reacting to the fulfillment of the prophecy, right? Talking to each other. Macbeth says, do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the thane of Cordor to me promised no less to them? Banquo, Tis strange and oftentimes to win us to our harms, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betrays in deepest consequence. So again, correctly naming the satanic source, describing the satanic method of equivocation. And look there at the plural personal pronoun us. Oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. The threat is to both of them. Again, these partners, these double cannons, these double lions, these double eagles, the threat is to both of them, but only one of them will be taken in by the threat because any one of them doesn't see through it instantly. And then the second one, fulfillment of the prophecy two, Banquo says, look how our partner's wrapped. And that's the second time he's used it to describe him. The first time he used it was when he was talking to the weird sisters. Um, I talked to you about the word wrapped in um, in class, but just to remind you, it comes from, it ties us back to hunting birds that we saw um, back in Act 1. The uh, eagles or falcons are raptors. They capture things with their claws. That's why the dinosaur, Velociraptor, is called that because it hunts with its claws. It seizes its prey. And it's also the etymological root word of rape, which is comes from rapere, the Latin to seize, to take away. So. Macbeth's reason has been wrenched from him, right? He is wrapped as if he is caught in the claws of one of those hunting birds that he was described as in the very first scene. Um, Macbeth, if chance may have me king, may chance may crown me without my stir. He's talking to himself, trying to slow him down. And Banquo says, new horrors come upon him. Like our strange garment, garments cleave not to their mould, but with the aid of use. So, We've got that clothing costume metaphor that will recur throughout the play. Um, the Thane of Cordor lives, why do you dress me in borrowed robes, right? Says, um, says Macbeth. 
and Banquo using it here too. So again, his insight, his clear sightedness about the nature of, of reality and illusion of uh, right clothes wearing and wrong clothes wearing. Remember Banquo to this audience is the rightful king, is the father of the rightful line of kings, whereas Macbeth is always going nowhere. We're performing before James I, we know that this king is illegitimate, right? Oh yeah, interesting point there, the fact that he calls Macbeth his partner, because the next time we'll hear the word partner is of course when Lady Macbeth is reading her letter from Macbeth, and he addresses her as my dearest partner in greatness. So if we're thinking about how um, the breakdown of, of proper gender roles works in this play, Banquo correctly sees his partner as Macbeth. Macbeth sees his partner as Lady Macbeth, his wife, with all the resulting and attached breakdown of correct hierarchy and loyalty and systems. All right, Banquo meets King Duncan. This is one of those ones where Duncan very much performs kingship with an extended analogy, which if you've read any other Shakespeare plays, kings, that's how you, you perform kingship linguistically, is with these courtly extended metaphors that speak to your role and your graciousness, right? Duncan, welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known, no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. And Banquo comes back with there, as in, in, in his heart, if I grow, the harvest is your own, right? Several things there. Banquo, like Macbeth, seems noble to Duncan and is no less deserved. So as we've seen repeatedly, they appear equally honourable, right? To the witches with their inversion and reversion of names, to the beginning, to the sergeant with the cannons and the animals and blah, 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 right? And here equally, no less deserved, no less to have done so, right? But Banquo, rather crucially, continues Duncan's extended agricultural metaphor of the king as farmer planting good men in the soil of Scotland, right? And that's where we go back to that seeds of time and the seeds in the apparition that I was discussing before. Banquo's seed, his heir, will eventually result in the harvest of James I. So multiple layers going on here, but um, all of them to do with kingship, rightful kingship, Banquo as, as the good man contrasted with Macbeth, the bad man, the foil of, right? But who both start off equally well. Then we um, we cut away from Banquo. We see no more of him for a while. We've had L Lady Macbeth and Macbeth arguing about the murder. Banquo and Macbeth meet up before the murder. <clears throat> the only lines um, I've missed out here are a brief exchange between um, Banquo and his son, Fleance. And then when Macbeth and Banquo bump into each other in the dark and uh, Banquo says, Halt, who's there? Or something which shows shows that he's takes charge, interrogative, you know, like on God. Anyway, um, so Banquo said, uh, oh, yeah, you're thinking about those witches. And Macbeth says, I think not of them, lying. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business. If you would grant the time, Banquo, mm, at your kindest leisure, Macbeth. If you shall cleave to my consent, when tis, it shall make honour for you. Now, Macbeth knows that he's about to kill the king, right? He thinks he's going to be king. So he's going to be bestowing some honours upon Banquo if he'll just meet up and talk about these witches. It's not an overt bribe, but it, it's entering the language and realm of bribery, especially when Macbeth is aware that he'll be able to bestow honours. And Banquo says, so I lose none in seeking to augment it. I'm not going to lose any honour in seeking to increase it but still keep my bosom franchised and my allegiance clear, I shall be cancelled, right? So Macbeth says it'll be good for Banquo if he does so, make honour for him. Banquo says he'll only do what Macbeth says if he can keep his bosom franchised and allegiance clear, if he can stay free of guilt and loyalty to the king, right? Banquo does not equivocate. His loyalties are quite literally clear, right? You can see through them, unlike the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth, unlike look like the innocent flower, but see the serpent under it, Banquo is saying, I am clear, I am open, and also I am loyal. There's a suggestion here that he has come to suspect Macbeth. He never actually accuses him. He dies before that point. Um, so some critics or, or some interpretations 
have said that it's not entirely clear that Banquo is really a good guy in this, in the same way that McDuff is. But that's not really Banquo's job in this play, is it? The job here is to show a man given the same temptations as Macbeth, who does not take them, show a man who questions reality, who questions the devil, who remains loyal, and fundamentally, who exists to father the line of kings that will go on to be James I. So Banquo, after the murder of Duncan, is when we really see him become suspicious. Banquo says, look to the lady, which really, you know, in some interpretations of the play could be the explanation of the whole play, right? Look to the lady, it's all her fault. So she's carried out with her fainting or not fainting, depends on how you, you perform that. When we have our naked frailties here to that suffer an exposure, let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know it further. Fears and scruples shake us, in the great hand of God I stand, and thence against the undivulged pretense I fight of treason and malice. As when he met the witches, Banquo sees evil immediately and is suspicious, doesn't fall for it for a minute. Just as when he interrogated the weird sisters, so he says they must question this most bloody piece of work. He never falls for appearances, ever. He sets up a binary opposition and declares his loyalty to one side, the hand of God versus treasonous malice. So it's time to choose sides at this point. Right the way along, Banquo has been brilliant at detecting evil. Remember all that language, the semantic field of Satan and the devil, used it from the beginning. No questions, no hesitation, no confusion. Um, and here too, now he's like, I will stand in the hand of God against pretense, right? Uh, then next time we see Banquo, Macbeth has been crowned. And we see Banquo doing a soliloquy. Everyone has to do a soliloquy at some point. And in the soliloquy, he's talking to his former partner, but it's part of the soliloquy. He's not really talking to Macbeth, right? So um, again, former partner, former buddy, former double, fellow, you know, fellows all together, but now completely different. Thou hast it now, King Cordor glams all, as the weird women promised, and I fear thou played most foully for it. So in this soliloquy addressed to Macbeth, Banquo reveals that he suspects his old friend of getting to the throne most foully. It's really crucial that he uses the word foul there because that's that's our word, isn't it? That has been associated with the witches and with Macbeth from Act 1, Scene 1, from Macbeth's first line, so fair and foul a day I have not seen. The fact that he uses that single word really indicates to us who are paying attention to the movement of the language that he entirely is beginning to understand what's happened, right? So that word foul is showing how insightful Banquo is, at looking at the language and lexis and discourse and tricks and ways of the supernatural. And then what follows is sort of real time insight into Banquo, considering the prophecies made to him and then dismissing them, which stands in direct contrast with, with a similar soliloquy we have from Macbeth way back in Act One, where he considered what he thought about the prophecies. So, mm, for yet it was said, it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speeches shine, why, by the verities on thee, may good, may they, may thee not my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? But hush, no more. So if it came true for you, Macbeth, might they come true for me as well and set me up in hope? But notice that that's a question. And then he says, hush, he silences himself and says no more, right? So again, you can argue, definition of foil there again, that we're seeing two different, two men who looked so similar, reacting so differently. We get to see the interior workings of their mind as they consider this piece of equivocation, this lie that is simultaneously the truth, right? And he does the right thing, which is unsurprising if you consider that this was actually staged for James I, who's great, 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 whatever granddad Banquo allegedly is. And then that's it, right, for Banquo. He dies. We have another very brief scene where um, he's like, get a horse to his son. And then, uh, of course, we have him say a couple of lines when he's murdered. But he's not in the play again alive, right? So we have post-mortem Banquo. And we're going to watch both of those in a second. One of them is from the Gould adaptation with Patrick Stewart. One of them is from the Polanski adaptation from 1971. Um, but don't forget that he's never left the stage because he's always there as, um, as James I's 
progenitor, as the father of the Stuart kings, as the man who gives them the right to have the kings of England. So he always stays there as sort of father of the kingdom. But um, yeah, that's it for now. We're going to watch those two adaptations and then talk about a little bit of this. More, that didn't make any sense to it. There you go. All right, thank you, year 11.